Welcome, everybody, to the next IITE seminar, where I'm very happy to say that we have Elisa Tebo with us. And the question, which is very important, both in ecology as in real life, should I be similar or should I be dissimilar? We're going to hear something about that from Elisa. So without further ado, Elisa, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, many thanks for the introduction and thank you for the invitation. So today I will present uh, some results mainly done in collaboration with Matilda Halson uh, as part of a postdoc fellowship uh, on community threat assembly processes in food webs uh, that was funded by Formas. So ah, it doesn't it works okay. <laughs> so the questions of um, of uh, how many species can coexist um, in ecological communities has been quite central for some time uh, because we can observe uh, communities such as plankton with highly uh, high number of species with many different trait uh, shapes and uh, these questions have been also quite central in uh, theoretical ecology uh, with various mechanisms that have been uh, studied uh, to try to understand these this questions of species coexistence and the structure of ecological community. So today I will mainly focus on one of the mechanisms that have been uh, uh, studied uh, in ecological theory um, on this context, which is how much uh, species can be similar or dissimilar uh, to coexist. So this is quite an old question in theoretical ecology. It has been mainly, uh, well, started to be studied uh, in the context of competition. And here I will describe a bit uh, one of the uh, main models uh, historically that have been developed on these questions, which is a Lotka Volterra competition model by MacArthur and Levins. So, um, the model is based uh, yeah, on competition uh, for resources and species basically are arranged uh, along uh, a niche axis, uh, which is a resource axis, and each species is defined by its preference, uh, which is um, UI here for species I, and uh, it has a curve of uh, resource uh, use uh, with a standard deviation of sigma e here that I will call the niche width uh, in my following talk. So the competition, the strength of competition is this model is uh, uh, defined by the overlap between species in their resource axis and is uh, mainly a function between the distance between the species uh, on the resource axis and the niche width, uh, which is sigma here. So this model um, yeah, have been studied for quite some a while. And one of the uh, classical results uh, is that um, for a stable uh, coexistence, um, in fact, species uh, need to be uh, dissimilar enough to coexist. And this dissimilarity is measured um, as a distance along this uh, resource axis. Uh, over the uh, niche width. So here is just uh, one of the examples of studies uh, on this question here. Um, and in fact, um, this study uh, at the start, we are focusing more on uh, equilibria. Uh, and um, in the, uh, well, some time ago already, um, numerical simulations of this uh, same model for competition highlighted that, uh, in fact, transient over long uh, transient times, you can have rather different patterns than uh, the one you can find uh, at uh, equilibria, meaning that instead of having uh, one species uh, uh, separated uh, over the niche axis, you can have groups of species which are uh, quite similar, um, separated um, with other groups of species. So this emergence of groups of similar species uh, have been found uh, in, this, uh, in different cases, uh, in Lotka Volterra models, but also in other uh, competition models, um, as found by De Andrea and, and collaborators in 2019, so basically, these patterns of species needs both to be quite similar and quite dissimilar to coexist for a long uh, periods. Um, seems quite uh, common, at least uh, for uh, competition models. 
So these patterns of uh, clusters of uh, similar species uh, with groups which are quite dissimilar um, also uh, relates with um, patterns that have been formed uh, empirically uh, by looking at the distributions of species uh, over trait taxes. Um, so, for example, uh, a number of studies have found that uh, you can find groups of similar species for phytoplankton uh, sizes, for uh, beetles uh, length, and also for uh, values of uh, traits for uh, tree species in uh, rainforest, where you can find uh, outlined uh, groups of species uh, at different uh, heights or wood density. So whether these patterns are uh, general or not, uh, I think really needs to be investigated further. Um, but um, it suggests that it can be quite interesting uh, to look at these uh, clusters of similar uh, species uh, in uh, ecological communities. So while in fact most of the theoretical ecology on this topic of groups of similar species have been really uh, focusing on competition, and with um, models for competition for resources, the Locta Volterra uh, competition uh, uh, model. In fact, we can ask um, whether these patterns can also be found uh, in food webs, uh, where we uh, study also uh, trophic interactions. So indeed, we know that trophic interactions uh, can also uh, strongly affect species coexistence, um, including uh, coexistence of species in competition. For example, uh, some works have shown that uh, when predators are specialized on a different prey, uh, they can uh, promote coexistence between uh, different prey competing for one limiting resources. Meanwhile, uh, predators that are quite generalist can also uh, strongly affect uh, coexistence by adding apparent competition among prey. So it can also uh, add an, another constraint to species coexistence. And in fact, uh, it has been shown by different models that uh, coexistence outcome depends uh, not only on species' ability to compete for res resources and resist to predation, but it depends on also uh, uh, ecosystem properties, such as the productivity of the system. Uh, for example, as shown by a study by Leibold in 1996, where uh, they shown that, uh, in fact, coexistence uh, was allowed at um, different levels of resource productivity, meaning that at low resource productivity, you can have only species that were highly competitive for resources that uh, persisted, while at high productivity, uh, you had uh, mainly uh, species that resisted to predation, and so coexistence uh, were uh, possible only at intermediate level of productivity. So, okay, trophic interactions uh, can be important also for understanding uh, coexistence along with uh, species competition. So we can wonder um, what are the relative importance of uh, competition and predation for these uh, species niche clustering patterns that have been found uh, by Schaeffer and Van Ness. So that's the main question I will uh, try to address here. Uh, and so with uh, Matilda, we studied basically a model with uh, two trophic level, uh, prey uh, that compete uh, and predators. And we were interested in uh, studying how much uh, prey versus predator niche width uh, can determine uh, these clustering patterns and how much do they depend on ecosystem productivity because it seems uh, uh, to uh, drive uh, the relative importance of competition and predation in, in other systems. So the model I will uh, study first here uh, is based on the Schaeffer and Van Ness model, so it's just an extension. Um, so we have uh, two trophic levels, we have uh, uh, species uh, that compete, uh, that's the Lotka Volterra uh, competition model, but with an additional trophic level with predators uh, yeah, basically feeding on the, uh, on the prey species. Uh, 
Um, and so competition between uh, the uh, prey level is as before, uh, defined by the distance between uh, the prey on a given niche axis with a niche width uh, defined by sigma n, uh, as before here. And uh, predation is uh, defined in a similar way, meaning that it depends um, that predators are organized on a yeah, niche axis for predators um, along the niche axis of a prey species. And it's the distance between the uh, value uh, of a prey predator along the niche axis and the value of a prey on its niche axis that determines the predation rate. And again, we have uh, the uh, width of the uh, predation uh, uh, curve uh, that determines here the niche width of predation, how much the predators are specialized or generalized on, on a set of, of prey. Okay, so that's the uh, basic model that uh, we are going to simulate here. So we followed the same approach uh, than in the paper of Schaeffer and Van Ness. Um, we have 200 uh, prey and 200 uh, predator species that are randomly uh, positioned on a circular niche axis uh, for prey and predators. And then uh, we simulate the dynamics and we are interested uh, on the uh, long transient uh, dynamics uh, looking for emergence of uh, uh, clusters. So, oh yeah, it works. Uh, so here is just an example of one run for the simulations, uh, a run where you have uh, clusters. Uh, you, here um, you have um, an example on the simulations where we are looking at the abundance of uh, predators uh, ordered along their niche axis and the abundance of the prey along their niche axis. And you can see that in this run, uh, we observe the emergence of three clusters, uh, both on the predators and the prey axis. So, because we were interested in uh, understanding uh, these clustering patterns, uh, we used a clustering algorithm developed by Dandria and collaborators, uh, the Kamins Gap, uh, to both uh, detect uh, the number of clusters on both the predator and the prey niche axis, and also assess whether the clustering pattern uh, differed or not from random expectations. And in the following, I will show uh, results on these uh, clustering patterns as a function of uh, the niche width uh, of uh, determining the, the competition of a prey, the uh, niche width uh, for the predations, and the prey carrying capacity that will be here uh, my proxy for uh, ecosystem productivity. Okay. So the next graph is a bit, <laughs> I will go slowly for it. Uh, it's a bit complex. So first uh, here I show the uh, number of clusters and um, the amount of simulations, the proportion of simulations uh, for which clustering pattern was significant for the uh, prey community. So looking at clusters along the prey niche axis and uh, we do so for varying levels of uh, niche width of predators and prey and for uh, a longer gradient of uh, uh, productivity with uh, low levels of k on the top and uh, high levels of uh, carrying capacity of prey on the bottom. So what we see um, in this graph, uh, first, regarding the significance of the clustering patterns, um, we find that overall uh, we have quite a large amount of uh, cases of simulations where uh, we find uh, significant clusters uh, on the uh, prey uh, community niche axis and about uh, between 50 and 70 percent of uh, simulations uh, uh, where we found uh, clustering patterns. And what is also quite interesting is that uh, you can see that if you contrast the case where you have a low K on the top uh, here and a high carrying capacity on the bottom here, you can see that uh, sigma N and sigma P have uh, quite uh, opposite effects on the number of clusters uh, that are found. 
When we are at low productivity, at low K, on the top uh, here, you can find that it's mainly uh, the niche width for competition, sigma n, that determines the number of clusters. When you have um, a very small uh, niche width, meaning that there is a few overlap in resource use of uh, uh, prey species, you have more clusters uh, than uh, when you go um, on high values of sigma n. And if you go um, at high uh, values of carrying capacity, it's not anymore sigma n that determines the number of clusters we observe, but sigma p. Basically, at low sigma p values, we have quite uh, uh, specialist uh, predators. And in that case, we have uh, more clusters than when we have uh, generalist predators. So definitely, both uh, predation and competition can determine uh, the number of clusters. Um, and uh, yeah, so here I was uh, showing results for a prey community, but we can also investigate the patterns for the predators because they are also uh, given niche access. And uh, in that case, well, you can see that there are uh, some difference between uh, with a prey community. Uh, first, um, although we still have uh, quite, uh, on average, 50% of cases where we have significant uh, uh, clustering patterns, it's less uh, common than for the uh, prey species. And also the effects of the carrying capacity uh, related to ecosystem productivity are quite different, um, especially at low carrying capacity. At low carrying capacity, um, it's not necessarily, uh, it's not only sigma n that determines the number of clusters for the predators, it's both sigma n and sigma p. While at high carrying capacity, we have the same results than for the prey community, meaning that it's only sigma p, the uh, niche width of predators, that determines the number of clusters. So what it means uh, basically here, uh, if we are at low carrying capacity, uh, we might have different uh, clusters for the prey and the predator community, which I'm going to show in, in this example of simulations here. You can see that for the prey community, we have uh, many uh, clusters uh, um, in, in the prey here, well, for the predator uh, community here, we have two main clusters. So it can be quite different, so it's not necessarily symmetrical. Um, and in fact, this happens mainly at low carrying capacity, uh, where uh, you can have, when you have generalist predators with high sigma p, you have a low number of clusters, while in the same case, you have a high number of clusters in the prey community. So basically, this uh, graph here summarizes just what I've just said. Um, in fact, at high carrying capacity, uh, we have uh, basically the same um, a strong correlation between the number of clusters among the prey niche axis and among the predator niche axis. While at low carrying capacity, um, especially uh, when you have generalist uh, predators with high sigma p, uh, you don't have such a strong correlation between the two. Okay, um, so I hope I, yeah, I didn't lost everyone here, uh, but basically um, what this first part shows is that uh, both uh, predation and competition can determine the clustering patterns uh, that were found in the competition model of uh, Schaeffer and Van Ness. And uh, we might ask, what is the difference uh, with the model with competition only? So, in parallel to the simulations uh, where we have a predator-prey uh, model, uh, where we looked at the clustering patterns, we run the same model but without predators to compare uh, the results between the two. And here, what I will show is uh, the average number of clusters for all the simulations together and for simulations that we run uh, for a uh, long time, uh, relatively long time, I would say. Um, okay, 
so in the graph here you have uh, yeah, the time uh, unit of the simulations um, with a number of clusters that were found for uh, the community with only species in competitions and the number of clusters found for the prey and predator communities. So you can see that there's no really yeah, strong differences between number of clusters uh, when you have competition only uh, and prey and predators. But the most striking difference, in fact, between the two, at least in our simulations, is the number of species per cluster uh, over time. So over time, uh, in the model uh, that we use, um, what you observe is that you have emergence of a cluster of similar species, but then you have extinctions of a species. And at the limit, at the equilibria, you have only one species per group. Okay. Um, and that's what you find rather quickly uh, with uh, competition only in the simulations. At the end uh, here of uh, our run, uh, we have basically only one or two species per cluster. However, uh, in our case, for the predator prey uh, model, in fact, the cluster, of course, the number of species uh, decrease uh, as uh, we go through time, but this decrease is a lot uh, smaller. So in fact, the, the uh, clusters are more persistent uh, when you have a predator prey model here. OK, so that's uh, competition only. So yeah, clusters seem to arise uh, quite strongly here. But another uh, thing that uh, I didn't say here is that one strong assumptions uh, we had in our model so far, uh, the model I presented, is that uh, the trait of the prey that determines competition and predation uh, is the same, um, meaning that uh, species, um, uh, a given species is going to compete uh, with the same set uh, of species um, that are and it's going to uh, have the same predators basically than its uh, neighboring uh, competitors. So we wondered also whether uh, this uh, strong assumption could affect a result uh, by considering that it's not necessarily the same trait uh, for a given species that is going to determine competition and predation. So we modified a little the model by considering a two trait axis for the prey uh, species, uh, a trait axis that is going to determine their competition, and a trait axis that is going to determine their predation. So in that case, uh, two species that can be very close by uh, on the competition niche, niche axis can be uh, very distant on the predation uh, niche axis, meaning that they are not going to share any more of a predator. OK. So how does it affect our results? So basically, when you have no links uh, between uh, the niche axis of prey regarding competition and the niche axis of prey regarding predation, um, OK, I will go slow for this graph, sorry. Um, so here, uh, I simplified a bit the graph before. We have only two cases. On the top, uh, you have low carrying capacity, so low productivity. And on the bottom, you have a high productivity case. Because we have two trait axes, uh, in fact, we can uh, look at clusters uh, on the prey niche axis related to competition, which is on the left or on the prey niche axis related to predation, which is on the right. And what is uh, quite interesting here is that um, at low carrying capacity, basically, um, the, this is mainly the uh, niche width on the prey uh, niche axis uh, related to competition that determines the um, the number of clusters so you have strong clustering on the prey niche axis linked to uh, competition while when you look at the uh, prey niche axis related to predation the clustering is not significant uh, you have no clustering at all looking at uh, traits related to defenses against predator basically and it is the opposite at high carrying capacity 
meaning that you find clustering on uh, the traits related to predation uh, that is quite strong and uh, this clustering is related to the niche width of predators. While when you look at uh, the traits related to competition, uh, basically the clustering is not significant anymore. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I can answer questions if it's not clear, but basically, in fact, we find a similar type of uh, results than we found when we had uh, only one uh, prey niche axis, um, meaning that it's the traits related with competitions uh, that are going to determine the clustering patterns at low carrying capacity, while at high carrying capacity, it's traits related to predation. Okay. So if I still have a bit of time, I just want to, to discuss a bit uh, the numerical results in relation to some uh, more math mathematical analyses that, that we performed um, on a simplified system. So basically, these clustering patterns, uh, they've been uh, uh, partly uh, explained from an analytical uh, perspective by uh, Fort and collaborators. Uh, and what they showed is that, in fact, uh, it's related uh, to the particular uh, structure of dominant eigenvectors um, when uh, the system is unstable. So what uh, they showed in this publication um, is that, um, in fact, the uh, stability of the system, uh, so this is the, the dominant eigenvalue uh, uh, value that you have uh, on the left uh, as a function of the number of species and uh, the niche width of uh, competition. And basically, as you can find in this graph, is that uh, in most cases the dominant eigenvalue is positive, so the system is unstable, except when uh, you have low number of species and when you have a uh, low value uh, of niche width. And what is quite interesting in the case uh, when the system is unstable, uh, when the uh, dominant eigenvalue is positive, is that in that case the dominant eigenvalue, uh, eigenvector, sorry, sorry, when you um, plot uh, the components of the dominant eigenvector against uh, the uh, corresponding value uh, along the niche axis of, of the species, uh, you can find that it's uh, periodic and that, in fact, its periodicity relates uh, directly to the uh, number of clusters that you find. Basically, in fact, a species which have uh, similar uh, or close uh, values on the niche axis have uh, similar uh, values uh, on the uh, eigenvectors. So species which are uh, close on the niche axis are going to uh, at equilibrium either going to increase or decrease together, this, which makes this, uh, this clustering patterns, basically. And the periodicity of the eigenvector determines the number of clusters that you find. So this uh, mathematically, in fact, can be directly related uh, to the uh, particular assumptions that have been made uh, in this uh, Lotka Volterra systems where if you organize uh, the species uh, evenly on a circular uh, niche axis, basically the Jacobian matrix at equilibrium uh, values, uh, when all species have, have uh, positive uh, um, equilibrium uh, densities, in fact, this Jacobian matrix has a really particular uh, structure. It is circulant. And uh, in that case, uh, we can express all the eigenvalues and the eigenvector um, in the case of a circulant uh, a matrix. And in fact, the eigenvector uh, follow a discrete Fourier transform, which make this uh, periodic shape, basically. So when the system is unstable, uh, it determines uh, the, the number of clusters. Okay. Uh, and one last thing I just want to say uh, on this slide, in fact, the dominant uh, eigenvalue here um, depends uh, mainly on uh, the niche uh, width, sigma n, and the number of species. So uh, sigma n really determines which uh, eigenvalue is dominant 
and then uh, the which eigenvector is going to be dominant, and that shapes the clustering pattern. So, um, in fact, um, to try to understand what happens in the context of a predator prey model, um, we, we used uh, the, um, the model developed by uh, Chesson and Kong um, of a free trophic uh, uh, level model where you have a, a species N, which I will call prey here, that compete for resources and are predated upon by predators. And this model is interesting because, uh, in fact, it can be approximated by a load Cavaltera uh, competition model uh, when resources and predators have uh, fast uh, dynamics uh, compared uh, to the species N here. And in fact, the results we obtain uh, can be understood uh, in, the in the way that um, when you approximate this system by a competition model, uh, with uh, the competition coefficient here, beta ij, uh, is expressed in fact as a function of both the overlap of the consumption of resources. Um, so that is the, the competition here uh, for resources. And it depends also on the overlap regarding predator uh, attack rates, uh, which can be seen here more as uh, apparent competition uh, between species. And what we can see in this model is that, in fact, the relative importance of overlap regarding competition uh, for resources and regarding predation um, is um, modulated basically by, by this uh, value here uh, that uh, Chesson and Quang call the relative predation in intensity that depends on the growth rate of uh, uh, resources, a mortality rate of the predators, and intraspecific uh, competition for resources and predators. So, because uh, the model can be approximated by a competition uh, Lotka Volterra model, in fact, the, the results previously with a circulant Jacobian matrix with clusters, in fact, can all be understood in the same way uh, here. And basically, um, if we assume that this uh, uh, resource overlap and predation overlap depends on the distance on the niche axis. Um, in fact, uh, when you have uh, the relative importance of predation that is low, the clusters are going to depend mainly on the uh, competition niche width, while when the relative importance of predation is high, clusters depend mainly on the uh, niche width for predators. So it's quite coherent with what we found uh, uh, numerically, basically, with a different model. Um, because uh, in this model, the relative importance of predation depends, among other terms, on uh, the growth rate of the resources here, which can be related with uh, uh, ecosystem productivity uh, in, in, in our model. OK. So. Yeah, sorry, maybe it was too much for, for a presentation, but basically uh, to try to conclude a bit uh, on this uh, niche uh, clustering patterns uh, with uh, including competition and predation, uh, what we found basically is that uh, we can as well find uh, these niche clustering patterns uh, in uh, predator prey models. And um, interestingly, uh, what we find, and uh, both numerical results and analytical results agree on that, is that um, uh, both predation and competition uh, can be viewed uh, quite symmetrically here, and they can drive uh, species niche clustering patterns. And in fact, um, the relative importance of predation and competition is going to depend uh, on various properties of the ecosystem, including the, the productivity of the system, meaning that at low productivity, it's mainly the competition that is going to drive and determines the number of clusters, while at uh, high productivity, it's mainly uh, the predation uh, that is going to determine the, the clustering patterns. So I think there are quite many uh, perspectives uh, on this topic of clustering patterns uh, in uh, food webs, uh, basically, and predator-prey systems. 
Um, and in fact, one thing I, I would be really interested in investigating uh, uh, further would be uh, to extend uh, this model, uh, not only on focusing on uh, uh, tree trophic or uh, bipartite uh, predator -prey networks, but more on general food web uh, patterns, where we could uh, wonder whether um, in models where uh, you have uh, food webs dynamics strongly structured by body size, that is going to, to determine basically the niche uh, predation niche of species, can we have uh, emergence of uh, clustering patterns that would, I think, in that case, uh, maybe relate to trophic groups um, with, um, yeah, so, yeah, that's one perspective here. So, yeah, I'm, I spoke for too long, but uh, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Thank you so much, Elisa. I know you did not speak for too long. You spoke just right. Okay. And with that, if you have a question, as usual, please raise your hand in the uh, participant list and I shall call on you. Any questions? Uh, yes, Mercedes, please go ahead. Yes, hello. Uh, thank you, Elisa. That was uh, quite interesting. Um, so uh, just a, a comment, and, and maybe we can see where that leads. Uh, before the, the Schaefer and Van Ness, these sort of clustering patterns have also been observed in models of strain, uh, strain diversity in host pathogen systems, in which you, you basically are consuming the susceptibles and the antigenic traits define your similarity in trait space. And, and in fact, the, the, those clustering patterns are, are part of the phylodynamic uh, models that have been studying in terms of finding clusters. And it is interesting that whether they coexist or replace each other uh, can be a, not just a function of the coexistence intensity, but also how fast the system can evolve in that trade space, mm. yeah. which is something that I think the, the pathogen systems bring that may be worth considering uh, as you think about these extensions, um, mainly because at some point you can impose the traits or you can consider correlation between the traits. Uh, but it's interesting to me that also the speed at which you evolve in that trade yeah. space uh, may may have, uh, well, at least in the pathogen systems, has had a clear, uh, clear role to play on coexistence and uh, niche patterns. Yeah, that's true. But I didn't speak at all about uh, evolution here, but because I'm, <laughs> yeah, I, it's not. It's a bit further away from my expertise. But definitely, yeah, uh, I think there are many things to explore on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, in case, uh, sorry, Mercedes, did you want to reply to that or? No, I mean, yeah, I didn't answer very well. In fact, I agree. I mean, it was a comment. Yeah, yeah, it was a comment just to say that there is this parallel between the yeah. studies in ecology and in the sort of models okay. of, of yeah. strain yeah. diversity, which mm -hmm. is a competitive system. And since the species here are not really isolated, there is, I mean, uh, they, they are yeah. very analogous. And I think like it's worth considering that. Uh, thank you so much. Yes. Uh, Giza, your hand is up. Please go ahead. Thank you uh, for uh, the uh, interesting lecture. And uh, I'm not necessarily understand uh, to everything. And uh, uh, I certainly agree that uh, uh, apparent competition is a, a kind of competition which behaves mathematically as competition. So, of course, we have to take into account the uh, predation. Uh, in the system. Actually, Simon Levin wrote a paper in 1970, more than 50 years ago, uh, 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 when he stated that counting the resources is, uh, uh, is not the good way of formulating a competitive exclusion. Mm -hmm. We have to count everything which behaves like a resource in mathematical sense that uh, uh, there is a two-way interaction with, uh, within that. And then uh, 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 then your uh, results that uh, sometimes the resource competition and sometimes the, uh, the uh, 
tradition uh, dominates the pattern. It's a, a, a it's a very transparent because if uh, 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 if uh, uh, the species are uh, limited from below, then uh, this uh, structure the competition if it is uh, limited by uh, from the above by the predators, then of course the predators. Uh, play this uh, feedback rules. So uh, 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 I like this, but I'm uh, very uh, skeptical about this uh, clustering uh, things. In the original uh, uh, Nash uh, 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 Sheffer uh, paper, uh, the predation niche width was zero. And then of course, uh, they uh, could coexist. And the another uh, problem is that uh, uh, anybody can coexist uh, with anybody with any kind of model if you tune the parameters up, uh, uh, apparently. Mm -hmm. So the real issue is the, whether the coexistence is uh, whether structurally stable against uh, giving advantage and disadvantage uh, to some species. And many of the models. Uh, uh, didn't test this, and uh, I think uh, uh, the and the third one, of course, that uh, uh, this uh, uh, prediction that the final outcomes are discrete uh, uh, species are for infinite time, and if you don't uh, wait for uh, infinite time, and then of course you have uh, clusters, and this uh, the combination of this, of uh, these three things can. Uh, 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 can give this cluster as, as far as I understand. I, I'm not sure whether you agree or, or uh, you think that it is not true. Yeah, well, I mean, I agree that in fact clustering patterns depends on on the on the parameters. That's for sure. We we didn't discuss that uh, much here, but it definitely uh, depends on the shape of a uh, competition and there are a number of um, uh, of assumptions uh, that uh, will typically i think uh, determine the these clustering patterns um, especially this uh, niche uh, circular niche uh, for example that, that seems quite important um, well, my impression is that, but I don't know all the literature on the niche clustering patterns, um, is that in fact, uh, at least if you don't, uh, you can deviate a bit from the strong assumptions that are made, you know, with this uh, niche uh, circular uh, structure and things, and you can still find uh, in some cases these uh, clustering patterns. So my impression is that um, uh, at least in the competition case, it can it can arise in a diversity of context. Uh, it would need to be uh, for a predator prey system, I guess. Of course, we would need to do the same, but I, I expect that the same uh, type of uh, parameters are going to play also the role as found in competition because of this symmetry, uh, basically. Um, but then, yeah, I, I guess, yeah, we need to explore much, uh, to really understand if it's a common pattern or not, uh, at least that's my, my, my take of it. But I guess Raphael also can, can discuss about that because he worked quite a bit on that. And his hand is up. And he's on the uh, yeah. Before before going there, I wanted to make one comment. Uh, yeah. Is uh, I don't know if you noticed, but uh, at least for the first half. So until uh, of the talk, until we got to the Chesson and Quang model, mm -hmm. all the exponents in the in the yeah. kernels were a four, not a yes. two. Yeah, Which, I you know that two. those have yeah. non-positive yeah. definites. Yeah. Maybe or so. So uh, actually, I think that would rule out any blatant kind of fine tuning. Yeah, yeah. So yeah probably fact, what's going on is that this is this is fine. It's just in the long time limit, the clusters will always collapse yeah. into a single species. Yeah. Yeah. 
but anyway, I, I won't uh, uh, take up time. Sorry, Raphael, it's it's uh, you're next. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Well, Elisa, thank you for the talk. I thought it was fascinating for some reason. Uh, so a comment in the question. So I've been wondering about this issue of generality of these results for a while, and I also looked at that fourth paper that you cited. And the paper relies on some assumptions that are blatantly not met, and yet we get the clusters. I know. So, yeah. Right. So I was thinking, well, we get clusters anyway. And like in that paper that you cited that I worked on, like I tried multiple different competition models, the clusters always show up. So I do get, I have a sense that clusters will always show up in models of competition. I think the critical element is. If the competition is of the type that leads to coexistence, then it's going to also lead to clusters. Because the type of competition that leads to coexistence is the type where competition inside species is stronger than across. And one great way to do that is by having competition depend on trait similarity. And I think that models that depend on trait similarity are going to lead to clusters. And I have my own arguments for that, but uh, I guess that's not what the question is about. So I thought it was awesome that you showed that with predation, you can also get that. And as Giza said, with predation can lead to competition. So maybe not shocking, right? But so my question is though, that um, when people look at trait distributions in natural communities and try to use those trait distributions to make inferences about what kind of ecological process is dominating, the paradigm has always been, if the traits look more different than we'd expect, that's competition. If they look more similar, it's habitat filtering. It's abiotic environments. The, the environment is filtering for species with a particular trait. Right. It's always been that way, and it still is. Right. If you go on Google Scholar and you look at 2023 papers that look at trade distribution, that is still the interpretation. And yet, you can write any model you like where any all that is happening is interactions among species, trait matching competition, or predation. Leave the environment out. You get those clusters. Right. So I never understood why this doesn't have more penetration with you know, the ecological community. And I was wondering. If you have any insights into whether it's because these are just not believable or more work needs to be done or, or what it could be. Yeah, that's a very nice comment because in fact, when we started, we were also interested in, you know, looking at this classical uh, way people measure in the field, this uh, over dispersion of traits and, um, and in fact, we, we didn't do it in the paper. Um, my impression, um, yeah, I guess people, uh, maybe one reason is that it's because it takes time <laughs> um, to, to, you know, go into the uh, more empirical uh, type of uh, uh, people. Another maybe insight uh, is that my impression also is that when people look at over dispersion under dispersion of traits, they have these particular metrics that they always use, which are not necessarily appropriate when you have this kind of uh, clustering patterns. So maybe um, one way to, to convince, you know, uh, people uh, looking at trade distributions would be to uh, make, uh, well, the tool you developed, for example, the Kamin clustering gaps, maybe more available or, I don't know, advertise it more for people looking at patterns in the field uh, and show that this uh, over dispersion traits maybe doesn't really describe well uh, what is going on. I have the impression that it's more related to um, discrepancy between the metrics that are used uh, to assess trait distribution, and then you are a bit stuck, uh, yeah, with the metric you're using. Uh, I don't know if I answer well your your question. You did. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. Uh, oh, Mercedes, please go ahead. No, I, I just wanted to comment on that because it is an interesting uh, question, but I think what has happened with those ideas of what is filtering and what is what is, uh, you know, essentially some influential papers uh, that come from expected patterns in community phylogenetics or community, whatever you call it, the combination of traits and phylogenies. 
And a lot of that was not based on dynamical models, on theory of dynamical models. So, and then there were a lot of metrics and we are beginning to see uh, some theory that concerns uh, dynamical models in that area. But I think well, way behind, uh, you know, similar efforts with pathogens. And I think there is a bit of uh, confusion on expectations that are not based on theory. And, uh, but, but there is a very extensive literature on what to expect. So, yeah, that's my impression about that, uh, the situation there. I don't know if it helps. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, of course. No, no, I, um, I, I was agreeing, basically. <laughs> Yeah, that is a uh, yeah a, that that is an in very interesting uh, valid point. Thank you. Uh, I I can I make a point either no, while people are thinking if they want to ask questions. So so uh, Rafa raised this point about the generality of the the, the clusters, and uh, I just wanted to add to that one perspective that uh, in one sense it's almost obvious that. That, that you would have them in the sense that if two phenotypes are very similar, then they are similar, that by definition means that they behave similarly under any environmental, biotic, abiotic, whatever condition. And that means that even if one excludes the other, that can only be a slow process. So in, in, in I, I think maybe that perspective helps understand intuitively why uh, these clusters must be a property of these models. I guess one interesting question is, is what's the correct scale? And is that why classical ecology thinks differently about these questions in that maybe MacArthur and Levins were really thinking in terms of the species scale and not intraspecific variability. In these kinds of models, the, the distinction between species and, and, and subtypes is, is completely blurred, right? So, so it's not immediately obvious looking at it, whether the clusters are varieties within a species or or, or, or across. So, uh, but Geza has something to say about that. Please, please do. If you uh, 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 look at the real life, of course, each uh, species has a cluster. And the usual explanation is that it is a selection mutation equilibrium. Uh, the stabilizing selection shrinks, shrinks the variance, the uh, mutations uh, uh, increases uh, uh, with sexual selection. It is uh, uh, more complicated, but the essence is this. No, uh, we uh, uh, we see that a, a limit of uh, zero mutation rate, which is a, a mathematical abstra abstraction. Uh, then, of course, uh, this mutation selection uh, 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 equilibrium is the zero uh, 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 width. But of course, it takes time uh, uh, until it reaches zero, and that's all. I think. Uh, so uh, everybody has a finite uh, 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 cluster, actually, but because of the because of a uh, uh, equilibrium of uh, variance increasing and variance decreasing factors, you always has a. A fitness function which has some, <coughs> and if you are in a maximum, then it is a stabilizing selection. This survives, this argument survives everything on the appropriate scale. I think. Sorry, Elisa, did you want to reflect on that? Well, I was coughing, but <laughs> uh, um, well, just to to comment on what you say, um, I, I I am main, at least because I'm more uh, you know a food webs ecologist and thinking uh, between uh, yeah species diversity, I still think that there's something uh, to to investigate uh, for clustering. Uh, including not only intraspecific but also interspecific uh, diversity and what i found quite amazing is that if you look at food webs for example you have often trophic groups you have groups of species that share similar prey or predator and 
yeah, they might be. It's it's like a clustering patterns. Also, I mean, you have uh, particular structures that might relate. Also, I don't know. Anyway, um, I think there's more to it that only intraspecific, and I think looking at different scale is an interesting uh, uh, perspective. So would that mean that um, much of that diversity is technically speaking transient? That I don't know. <laughs> uh, maybe or uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, thanks, uh, and Rafa, please go ahead. Well, you're about the transients. Yes. Like you and I have worked on a similar problem, right? Uh, how to make the transient permanent? And there's a few ways, right? One of them is any level of immigration. Another could be mutation coming into the population. Another can be another niche axis, right? The hidden niches idea, right? So if your species compete on this axis and cluster on this axis, but they also compete on another axis, which adds stabilization, that can make uh, the clusters permanent. And if I'm not mistaken, I think what Elisa showed is along those lines, when you have another axis, uh, which is predation, creating apparent competition among our consumers, the clusters are now more persistent. And I feel like if you keep adding more niche axes where species can differentiate on those extra axes, your clusters are going to be even more, uh, more long-term. Um, yeah, I feel like this issue of transients can be one of the reasons why uh, clustering as a signature of biotic interactions hasn't been more, uh, hasn't caused more of an impact because people expect equilibria, uh, equilibrium of models to be what is represented in nature. But I would argue that pretty much the opposite should be the, the natural expectation. Um, and also like whether you're gonna get clustering or what results at the end of the, the simulation, which is limiting similarity, is an issue of time scales. It's going to be time scale of, of competitive exclusion versus time scales of dispersal into your community, for example. And, and that might determine what kind of pattern you may get. I also think that one of the reasons why we still think, you know, similarity means filtering and uh, and differences mean competition is because if you have two species, then indeed, the more different they are, the better, right? Uh, but once you add more than two, and this was shown by MacArthur and Levins in that 67 paper that Lisa started the talk with, if you have more than two, if you have a resident community of two species and somebody else is going to invade, if that species can invade, the best place to invade is right in the middle. So as far away from the residents as possible. But if that species cannot invade, now the best thing it can do is to invade right next to one of the residents because that makes it be excluded more slowly. Right, so what happens between from a resident community of one resident and you invade versus a resident community of two residents and then you invade is completely different. And I think our intuitions are, are mostly based on what happens between a pair of species. There is one resident and I'm going to invade. Uh, whereas if we were to extend that logic to a community with lots of species, you know, intuitions start failing because now you need to account for competition with everybody else. And that's where the models show that indeed you do better if you're next, right next to one of the successful strategies. Okay, this is becoming a rambling comment, so I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> no, that is fine, and thank you. I don't know, Elisa, if you wanted to say anything. I'm, I'm just, I, I will bring up one point, Rafa, uh, oh, but Elisa wanted to say something, sorry. No, no. Okay, uh, just one one quick point, which is, uh, and I'm not sure how to think about that either necessarily, but uh, in that three species case when you, that you mentioned, when there's no space to invade, it is true that the fitness gradient points in the direction of more similarity, but I don't think we can forget that all that fitness gradient, all, all the fitness functions absolute value is all negative, right? So, so you technically cannot invade. Yes, yes, you're... It's true that the more fit type is closer to 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 the already established resident, but it's still a negative growth rate. Uh, I'm not sure if that really matters in the big scheme of things. Uh, just wanted to bring that up. Yeah, but it just means that if a species comes in that is not viable, right? That species will be excluded more slowly if it is near the resident. Right, so if you do at all observe non-equilibrium 
Fair enough. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. looking cluster. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Fair enough. Very, good. very true. Thanks. Oh, but Theo has a question. Please go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Thanks for the interesting talk. I wanted to ask quickly. I think if I understand the fort et al. argument, it's that you get some periodicity in the eigenvectors, and this shows up as clusters um, from the circulant matrix. And I was wondering if you just have like more or different forms of interaction matrices, they could also generate some patterns that are typical in the eigenvectors. And then do you see those as clusters or some other more complicated pattern than clusters? Like, I don't know, you know, maybe, yeah, something that's not peri periodic or like maybe it's twice periodic or something else, depending on a more complicated interaction structure. Yeah, that's a good question. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, it could be it could be an interesting question. Uh, the microbial systems uh, that uh, that are playing these games are playing it in a huge trade space uh, and not by chance. So the patterns that one can detect are different from neutral or random. Uh, if you look at the network, at properties of the network of similarity, but it's hard to pin down that those are clusters. So it's an interesting question as you move into higher trade space. Uh, Theo, just incidentally, I do think that this idea of the periodicity is one of those uh, assumptions that you don't actually need. Yes, you do need some symmetries in the system to get a periodic eigenvector, but what we call clustering isn't necessarily the fact that clusters all look like each other and not evenly spaced on the axis. It's just the fact that if there is a species that's very successful, it's very likely there's another species right next to that one that is almost as successful. So I would say really where, where the clustering comes from is not the periodicity, the ups and downs being very neat and regular. It's more of the continuity of the fitness function. It's as like Yuri said, if species A is very successful, that strategy is the best. Then the next best thing is to be infinitesimally close to that species. And I, I think it's pretty hard to break with that, right? Like how do you violate that idea? that if you're going to be infinitesimally close to, to the successful strategy, maybe you're not viable forever, but you're going to be viable. You're going to be present for a long time, right? And that's, I think, where the clustering comes from. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. I was I was wondering if like maybe something about the geometry of those clusters or the, the relative magnitude might be inferred from some other eigenvector argument. But it, that, that makes a lot of sense to me that the appearance of clusters is sort of generic besides the eigenvector patterns. Yeah, like if you look at models of a hierarchical competition, like competition colonization trade-offs, for example, in plants, the clusters don't look symmetric at all. It's like some clusters on the like small seed size of the axis are very skinny and tall. Clusters on the large side of the seed axis are very wide and low. So it's not like you have some function that repeats itself in the trade axis. You don't have that in these models, but it is still true that you have a, a generic up and down type of pattern uh, where you know the immediate vicinity of a successful strategy is almost as successful. Thanks for that. Are, are there any other questions? May I ask a, a, a few more technical questions? questions or slash uh, the first of all the most awkward one of all which i should know but i don't is this published yet it, it is oh okay then i will not give, be giving those advice about <laughs> what to show and what not to show i guess i will ask I, I will formulate this as a question then when you were plotting the richness against time against number of generations would it make more sense to plot some sort of more fine-tuned diversity metric like Shannon entropy or or Simpson index, something like that, because the, the species get more uneven in, in the clusters as yes. well. That's true. Um I know that we looked at different metrics of diversity. I don't know if we looked at it inside the clusters. I don't remember. Um, but yeah, we could have looked at Shannon diversity inside the clusters indeed. Um, and I guess then you would have seen something that decreased maybe uh, more over time. Um, however, I think that the patterns of the difference between competition and predator-prey model would 
definitely stay because mm. uh, competition, you have really extinctions basically of everything quite fast, except one. Yeah, okay. So thanks, that, that was one question. And the other one was, did I understand correctly that for the first 70% of the talk, you used the exponent of four? Yes. And But in the, in the last bit, you used an exponent of two. It doesn't matter for the last bit, in fact. Okay. Um, okay. In fact, I think in the simulations for the last part, we use exponent of four, but for in any way for the mathematical demonstration, it doesn't it holds whatever the exponent. Okay. Well, not necessarily whatever the exponent, but at least it works for wide range. Yeah, for quite a range. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As soon as the matrix is circulant, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any more questions? If there are no more questions, then thank you so much again, Elisa, for the thank great talk much. and everyone for the great discussion. And we will see you, I believe, next week already. And yes, I think it yes, is uh, Hanakoko next Hanakoko week. is coming and, and, and giving a talk. So hope to see you all then. So thank you again for coming and have a very nice rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Thank you.